Do me a favor and imagine this line coming from Timothy Chalamet's head. He, Genghis Khan, killed the way I kill, by sending out his legions. There's another emperor I want you to note in passing, a Hitler. He killed more than six million. Pretty good for those days. This is a quote from Paul Atreides in Frank Herbert's Dune Messiah. The source material Denis Villeneuve plans to adapt for his next and apparently final Dune film. To give you a little spoonful of sugary context to help wash down all the fascistic vibes we're starting off with here, this quote comes from a conversation between Paul and Stilgar in which Paul is ordering Still to learn about some of the most brutal and effective military tyrants of the quote-unquote old earth. With the new pressures of his young imperial rule compounding and mysterious new adversaries plotting against him at every turn, Paul wants his loyal yet unlettered advisor Stilgar to brush up on his military tactics and history to make him a more well-rounded servant. And what better place to start is there than Hitler? You know? You sure about that? That's why? From the very beginning of his saga, Herbert wanted to sculpt a narrative that would serve as a stark warning against the dangers of hero worship. But after he realized like 95% of the people who read Dune took one look at Paul Atreides and were basically like, This guy fucks, am I right? He realized he had to opt for a sequel that had a little bit less... <laughs> and a little bit more... <laughs> if you know what I mean. Suffice it to say, he made quick work of remedying some of the most common misconceptions about his protagonist in the second book. Because unless you're actually just a very bad person yourself, it's damn near impossible to still think someone's cool and admirable after hearing them lovingly praise the body counts of history's most brutal dictators and warlords. Now, I'm sure you might be thinking, this seems like a pretty easy thing for an adaptation to just gloss right over, and it definitely is. I mean, I would be absolutely gobsmacked if the suits and bean counters over at Warner Brothers would ever even consider letting their leading boyish heartthrob, Timmy C, utter that line or anything even remotely like it in Dune 3. But the problem is the Hitler stuff is really just the tip of the iceberg here. Just to name a few of Paul's uh, questionable misdeeds in Dune Messiah, he denies his imperial subjects a constitution. He allows his Fremen legions to kill 60 billion people throughout the known universe. And there's a scene where he totally gets turned on by seeing his sister naked. I'm sorry, Anya. I really don't think you knew what you signed up for when you did this. And while sure, modern audiences are definitely not unaccustomed to rooting for anti-heroes. If the last 20 years of prestige TV have taught us anything, it's that people will still love murderers, thieves, drug kingpins, and extremely bad husbands as long as they're well-written and artfully presented. That being said, a main character who gets off on light Hitler worship while spearheading a brutal theocratic autocracy might prove to be a step too far for your garden variety general audience member. But on the flip side, this descent into tyranny should not really be shocking to anyone who read the very obvious writing on the wall or on Lady Jessica's face in Dune Part 2. By the end of the film, Paul has completely alienated the love of his life in favor of a calculated marriage of political convenience and effectively turned all of his Fremen cohorts into religious fanatics, chanting his name as they board ships to go blow up a bunch of noblemen with nuclear weapons. I mean, fuck, even Hans Zimmer transposed his bombs to a minor key in the last act to correspond with this. Anyone expecting a happy ending for Paul, the Fremen, his new subjects, or anyone else probably wasn't paying very close attention to part two. But even if the second film primed most filmgoers to expect tragedy in the third adaptation, I really don't know if general audiences will be able to stomach just how tragic things get for Paul and company in the second novel. Alright, I'm getting very tired of speaking in vagaries, so here's your actual spoiler warning for Dune Messiah. The last act of Messiah kicks off with Paul being blinded by a stone burner, which is a universally banned form of atomic weapon. Much like Neo in the Matrix, he loses his physical eyes, but his prescient abilities allow him to see nonetheless through what the book refers to as the oracular spectacular. Sorry, sir, I meant oracular vision. Now, in Fremen culture, the blind are doomed to walk out into the desert to be taken by Shai Halud. Stilgar is quick to reluctantly remind his beloved prophet of this fact, but Paul rebuffs him by saying that Arrakis is under Atreides law now and this barbaric custom isn't really of much relevance anymore. 
I'm glossing over a pretty sizable chunk of key plot points here for brevity's sake, but eventually Chani dies while birthing twins, and much like their aunt Alia, they are preborn, which basically means born with full awareness of not only their own personalities, but also millennia's worth of ancestral memories. One of those mysterious adversaries I mentioned earlier threatens to kill Paul's children if he doesn't renounce his imperial title and holdings. But Paul's son Leto briefly allows him to see through his newborn eyes and find the perfect vantage point to throw a lethal dagger into the eye of his would-be killer. In the aftermath of Chani's death, the combination of Paul's grief and the overwhelming burden of infinite potential futures shatters Paul's oracular vision rendering him fully blind for the first time. Reneging on his proclamation of a new Arrakis under Atreides' law, he decides to walk out into the desert as a blind Fremen in accordance with the native custom of his adopted people. Yeah, so in case this was ever in doubt, we're definitely not getting any medals, bent knees to hobbits, or a three-way hand-holding session at the end of this particular fantasy series. But it's not just the exceedingly un-Hollywood darkness of the ending that's the issue here. It's also that it's really not a true ending for Paul at all, because Paul survives his desert walk turning up in the next book nine years later rebranded as The Preacher, Arrakis's premier blasphemer of the religion of Muad'Dib. But to be fair, Paul serves as much more of a supporting character in Children of Dune. If anything, his appearances feel more like an epilogue to the saga's first protagonist before Herbert passes the baton along to Leto II. Still, Villeneuve and his creative team are definitely going to have to contend with this plot development one way or another. But beyond the weirdness, beyond the darkness, beyond even the Hitler stuff, the biggest problem Villeneuve will have to face when adapting Dune Messiah is that it's just so fucking boring. I'm just kidding. I, I love Dune Messiah. In fact, I think I like it a little bit more than the first one, if I'm being honest. But regardless of what I might think of it, there's a very good reason why Messiah has retained a uniquely divisive reputation within the fanbase for so long. And most of that has to do with just how shockingly different it is from Dune. The first book, while still intellectually engaging and thought-provoking in its own right, is a vastly more accessible and conventional piece of science fiction complete with clear-cut villains, engrossing revenge plots, and more sword fights than you can shake a Chris knife at. The central narrative thrust of Dune follows a cycle of sorts. This cycle sees opposing factions enacting their opposing political machinations. You know, the good old plans within plans. Then eventually, those plans culminate in tightly sequenced action set pieces that keep the plot churning and the characters developing in readily apparent ways. Messiah, on the other hand, is a far more cerebral and understated work. The cycle of Messiah's narrative leans much more heavily on the plans and the machinations and much less on the action set pieces. I'm all sure there certainly are moments of climactic action in Messiah, there's really nothing that lends itself as well to highly exciting cinematic adaptation as Paul riding a sandworm for the first time, or fighting Janus, or fighting Fade Rautha, or attacking the Emperor in the book's final chapters. In Messiah, the closest thing we get to any of that is the stone burner scene, and also the weird, kind of glossed over climax where blind Paul uses baby eyes to kill a shape-shifting scientist who is pretending to be a little girl for the entire second half of the book. What? If you think that's weird, it's seriously all downhill from here. Paul's jihad is happening all throughout the book, and the implications of the war are felt acutely in the narrative, but it's only ever something we hear about secondhand. Of course, Villeneuve could easily make the war more relevant by deviating from the book and sending Paul to a battleground planet for a well shot war scene, but the fact remains that Messiah really isn't about the war. It's mostly about the way Paul's prescient abilities and the mindless zealotry they've created have deformed and corrupted himself, his family, and the billions of people he's now responsible for. At its foundation, Messiah is a palace intrigue story that consolidates the thematic tissue Herbert was introducing in the first book. And you know, in a perfect world, this wouldn't be a problem at all. But after the bombastic and beautifully shot action sequences we all saw in part two, 
general audiences and Warner Brothers are most likely going to be expecting Villeneuve and company to at least meet or hopefully exceed that high level of action and excitement in the final chapter. And unless Denis plans on really changing the story of Messiah, the source material simply does not call for that kind of film. But to close this out, if anyone is up to the task of turning an exceptionally strange, heady, unconventional, and challenging sci-fi book into an excellent film adaptation, it's Phil Noe. With part two, he's built up a lot of goodwill with audiences, and I think if he makes enough concessions in the right places and adds enough explosions and sword fights, he'll probably be able to pull the rabbit out of the hat again. So anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. Um, this is going to be my last Dune video for a while. I just want to start getting into some new topics on the channel. And we'll get back to Dune whenever we got some news about Part 3 coming out. But, uh, you know, like and subscribe to see some of the other video essays I got on the docket. I got a lot coming out in the next couple weeks. And uh, I'll catch you all soon.